Let me thank uh, all of you, starting with you who have organized this uh, workshop. It's our 23rd workshop, and uh, I'm very happy that so many of you could come. And what I'd like to do in the, this first uh, lecture is to give you a very uh, general introduction. And I apologize for those when I uh, repeat uh, things which are obvious to anyone, but it, it be, has become useful uh, to go through some of the details uh, very quickly. So I will do it very quickly, but as a reminder uh, that we have some concepts which are needed in order to really uh, go to this one. Let me point out a few highlights. We are talking about density functional theory, showing here Walter Cohn. Uh, you also see John Slater. Uh, I could mention that I was postdoc with him a few years ago. Uh, it was more than 50 years ago uh, that I was with Slater, lo uh, augmented plane wave, Ole Anderson, uh, the LAPW method, and we want to get the basic concept what is needed for, for Win 2 k uh, There is a review article, I'll show you more review articles in a moment. And this is one example which uh, I will mention briefly uh, just to give you an idea. If you use a system of this size, uh, and this is a unit cell, this unit cell contains 1,100 atoms. I'll mention that in a, in a few moments, just to give you a feeling why this is important. So let's see what is the idea of this code. So we have several concepts, well, the cone density functional theory, which I will talk about. Uh, Slater has introduced the APW method in 1937. Even I wasn't born that, at that time, Ori Anderson, 75. Then the Wien to K code, uh, since we heard this comment about Wien and Wien, many of the registration we receive uh, are giving the name Wien, Wien instead of Wien. Uh, okay, we, are, uh, uh, we know about this. So the Wien code was developed 35 years ago in the year 2000. We gave it the year in the year 2K, we gave it the name mean 2 k uh, and uh, this is one of the most accurate codes. I will mention that uh, a little bit later. So it's one of the most accurate codes, all electron, relativistic, full potential, and these are key, uh, keywords which I try to explain. Uh, so they're, they're widely used in academia and in industry, and it's used for solid surfaces, uh, for all kinds of properties and many applications. And you can find many applications where the mean code was used uh, on the website. So you can find many details. So let's uh, have a quick summary. I won't go through that, but just to have it, you have this on, on your uh, on the documentation, and there are several review articles. I mentioned also the one from Stefan, who has written a very nice chapter. And so if you really want to read more details, you find it in one of these review articles. Uh, there are many papers which use Wien, but these are papers which give a survey and, and a summary of, of concepts, and they might be useful. And I'll mention one of the others later on. So what is the aspect of this workshop? We have to cover several aspects uh, to really uh, make use of, of a, a quantum mechanical calculation. We have to discuss the atomic structure. We have to discuss the quantum mechanical treatment. Uh, then density functional theory and beyond. Uh, how to solve the quantum mechanics. And this is the LABW method. Uh, applications which will be covered in several uh, additional lectures uh, from structure, surfaces, core level spectrum, NMR, hyperfine interaction, one function, and the like. So there are keywords which you hear later on. Uh, the software development is important. We will not discuss this in detail, but especially Peter Blaha will show you many aspects in this context. They are important. It's the accuracy, the efficiency, which kind of system can you treat, the user-friendliness, whether it's commercial or academic, 
So some of these aspects, and we won't cover all of that here, but these are, are important aspects which need to be considered. What is the purpose of all these things? That we can get an insight or understanding in material science problems and find analysis. And it's a combination, and this is also uh, typically for us, let's say, we try to combine chemistry, physics, mathematics, computer science, application, material science, all that. And that is different languages, and we try to combine all of them uh, to make, uh, to uh, really uh, get progress in this field. So let's call some of the challenges for theorists. What we want to do is we want to study real materials at the atomic scale. So if you want to study concrete, that's a different length scale. We want to study something on the atomic scale, and for that purpose, we need a quantum mechanical treatment, and we focus on density functional theory. But we also mention here in some talks what is beyond the conventional uh, density functional GW method, dynamic mean field theory, beta sub beta equation, random phase approximation. They are just uh, short uh, uh, words to make that. Uh, in order to re reach that, you have to be efficient so that you also can treat complex materials. And so you need uh, good algorithms and the like. And so this is partly uh, mentioned here, but it is very important. And the other aspect is you want to compute more and more properties, specific properties, so that you can compare directly what you compute with something in the experiment. And that means you have to provide new, uh, new properties. So let's start out with the first topic, the atomic structure. Now, this is a repetition, and I hope most of you know these details, but I briefly mention it just to summarize what is needed here. So what we assume in the atomic uh, crystal structures presented by a unit cell. So we assume, and I think this is very often ignored because it's trivial that everybody does that, we use periodic boundary conditions, which is an approximation. The unit cell is repeated to infinity. You have never seen an infinite crystal. So you have to make an approximation. You should appreciate that. Uh, sorry. Uh, so, oops. Yeah. Uh, so we have the unit cell. Then we have a real crystal is finite. It has surfaces, impurities, defects. Uh, I will briefly mention also the idea why is nanomaterials, why are nanomaterials different from bulk materials? Just to give you a brief uh, uh, aspect about this. Symmetry, we use space group, block theory, I mentioned it briefly, what is involved in this context. In theory, the atomic structure is an input which is a big advantage if you compare it to an experimental situation. On the one hand, we can also do artificial structures, for example, uh, something which doesn't exist in nature, you still can compute it, the property. If you want to say, well, if I replace an atom by something else, what would happen with the property? So you can do artificial, you could do computer simulations. In experiment, you guess what the atomic structure is, and you may not know it really in detail. So it is not perfectly known, and the single crystal microsystem, powder, nano, whatever you have, is a different one than what we assume in theory. And this is an aspect one should appreciate uh, if you compare theory with experiment. Uh, so let's go to the crystal structure, and this is a repetition, a very quick repetition. So fast your seat belt, and let's go through it quickly. We have a unit cell, it's defined by three lattice vectors. Uh, we have Bravais lattices, the atomic basis, the Wyckoff position, symmetries, space group, Wigner cell sign, reciprocal space. Uh, and the, the electronic structure uses this periodic boundary condition, Bloch theorem, I mentioned that briefly, and then the Schrodinger equation, which we have to solve in order to understand the electronic structure. So let's start out with the unit cell. Uh, if you have a unit cell, uh, it is defined by the three uh, basis vectors, A, B, C, and the angles alpha, beta, gamma. So the unit cell containing one lattice point is called, called a primitive cell. So if we define this unit cell, uh, then uh, this is the basic concept of, of a crystal structure. 
Now, a very simple thing which everybody of you knows, this is a primitive cell, but you could also have a body-centered or a face-centered cell in the cubic case, and I think everybody knows that in this particular case, ABC is equal, and the angles are 90 degrees. So if you do that more generally, then we have seven different crystal structures, triclinic, monoclinic, tetragonal, cubic, trigonal, hexagonal. So there are seven, and if you allow this face-centered, uh, body-centered aspect, then you get 40, 14 Bravais lattices. That's the next concept. Now let's go to the Wigner side cell. What is the construction? The basic idea is if you choose a lattice, you can use all kinds of unit cells in a, in a direct space. But there's a unique way of going uh, to define uh, the Wigner side cell. If you connect a given atom with a neighboring atom and you have a, a plane, that uniquely defines a unit cell, which is called a Wigner side cell. And the same concept is also used in reciprocal space. And this unit cell in reciprocal space is then called Brillouin zone. So this is just a repetition of concepts which are useful. Uh, let's illustrate the fine particle size with this picture. Now, if you take an FCC unit cell, in a simple, in a cubic structure, and you repeat this single curve uh, three by three by three, and let's assume this would be a particle, a finite particle, not the infinite unit cell, a finite particle. Then uh, the reason for doing that, it's easy to count the number of atoms. If you take the smallest cell, then you have 100% of the atoms on the, on the surface. And if you make it bigger, the percentage of the surface atom decreases. If you go to the edge atoms, for example, here, oops, if you go to the edge atoms here, uh, I was at edge atoms, then you see you have a high percentage of edge atoms and it decreases with system size. So if you have a big system, then uh, you could say, I ignore the edge atoms, I ignore the surface atom, uh, let's assume it's bulk. But if you have a small particle, oh, on top you have the one in nanometers, an estimate, so if you have a 10 nanometer particle size, then you still have, let's say, 15% or so uh, atoms on the surface. And the atoms on the surface behave differently. And that is, for example, important for catalysis or for some of the properties. Why are nanoparticles different than bulk materials? This is one uh, simple explanation that you simply count the atoms. So an atom here has no neighbor on one side and a neighbor on the other side. So they behave differently and they could relax and they could form uh, catalysis, for example. So this is the atomic structure, some aspects. Let's go to the next aspect, the quantum mechanical treatment. If you want to study the electronic structure, we need a quantum mechanical treatment. Uh, so the main scheme that we are going to use is density functional theory. And what the physicists often call us, this is a mean field approximation and which requires approximations. And that is a very essential point that you should keep that in mind. Uh, so uh, the, the, the essential statement was honed by Cohn, and I'll come to that in a minute. And what they showed by, uh, by mathematical uh, uh, exact uh, definition, they showed uh, all you need to know of a system is the electron density to determine the total energy. So that sounds trivial, and that has also been done by the Thomas Fermi, I'll come to that in a moment. But basically, what is the many electron wave function? It depends on many variables. Now take the example I showed you on the, on the uh, first slide. Uh, you have uh, a system with 1,100 atoms. They have 25,000 electrons. If you treat the many electron uh, case, in this case, you have uh, a many wave function, uh, many electron wave function, which depends on the uh, each electron has uh, for the wave function four coordinates, three coordinates per spin. So that means this many particle wave function would depend on hundred thousand variables. So just imagine if you want to store that or whatever. Uh, so it, it, it's obvious that you cannot solve the problem with the many electron treatment. 
Now, what density function theory is, is an enormous simplification. All you need to know is the electron density. And even in that system with the 1,100 atoms, the electron density depends on three coordinates, x, y, z, that's it. So if you know the density, you know everything. Yeah, in principle. But now we have to do it in practice. And then we need some, some more uh, ideas. And uh, I'll summarize the quantum mechanical treatment in Jacob's letter. And we also mentioned, and there will be a separate talk, how we can go beyond the simple uh, density functional theory. But let's go to the Bloch theorem uh, before we uh, enter the uh, density functional theory in detail. Uh, there is one more uh, thing which uh, everybody should remember. And that's Bloch theorem. So basically, you have the Schrodinger equation, kinetic energy, potential energy, H psi x plus E psi, one dimensional case. And in such a case, let's do it one dimension, then it only depends on one variable. And that has a reason to do it in one dimension because you can do it uh, graphically. Uh, then we know that the potential is, has a translational invariance. So if you add to the uh, coordinate x a lattice constant a, the potential is periodic. So in each unit cell, you have the same potential. Now, this is also true for the electron density. So if you add the electron density, a lattice constant, it's periodic. Now, how do you obtain the electron density? You uh, get the modulus of psi star psi, and this gives you, uh, this is periodic, has translational uh, invariance. But the wave function is not periodic. So if you move the wave function from one unit cell to the next one, the wave function changes. But since this is true, psi star psi must be periodic, it can only be different by a phase factor mu, and the phase factor mu must obey this rule. Mu star mu must be one. And the application, if you do that g times, and that is the graphical representation of the Bloch theory in one dimension, if you have a wave function and you go around uh, g times, then you're back at the original position. Then you're periodic, which what that means, if you add g times the lattice constant, you are back to the original wave function. So it becomes periodic after a finite number of, of steps, unit cells. And mathematically, that means mu to the power of g must be 1. And that can easily be solved. It's e to the 2 pi i, a small g, to capital G. Now, if you write the g in, uh, in standard convention, then you write it 2 pi over a, a small g over capital G. And then, with this definition, you have this factor as e to the i k a. And that means the Bloch theorem then reads, if I change the wave function by a lattice constant, I know what the phase factor is. And this defines uh, a quantity k, and this has 2 pi over a, so it's reciprocal in space. And this is the basic concept of the reciprocal space, a decay vector, if you do it in three dimensions. And I think this is a very important concept which we should uh, uh, remember. Now, in a picture, if you change the wave function of psi, you can write it as this Bloch function times a function which is periodic. So graphically, you have the, the Bloch function shown in blue, and then the periodic function. So the real wave function is not periodic in, in, uh, in, uh, in a solid, but you, we know how the periodicity like. And for this purpose, we need the, uh, the periodic boundary conditions. So only with the periodic boundary condition, we can formulate Bloch theorem and so on. So since uh, this is a, a periodic, you can restrict the k vector to the first Brillouin zone, which in one dimension would be pi over a from minus pi over a to plus pi over a. So this is the basic concept what is needed in this case. So let's try to see how can we solve the Schrodinger equation. And there are many aspects. and. Uh, points which uh, we are going to use uh, are marked in red. So how do we solve the Schrodinger equation Hamilton uh, psi uh, phi epsilon phi? 
uh, uh, kinetic energy potential energy. So the question, there are many questions. I'm, I won't go into all the details, but this is a quick summary of what you have to consider of solving this. So let's look at, at this equation. It's the form of the potential. In the 70s, last century, uh, one has used the Maffentin approximation. I'll show you that a, a bit later. And here we use the full potential. There's also the option to using a pseudo potential in this case. So there are different ways of choosing the potential. There are different ways of treating relativistic effects. We have a special lecture on relativity. And one can also do non-relativistic or fully relativistic, semi-relativistic calculations. So relativity is important. How do you represent a solid? You can say a solid is a number of finite cast of atoms. We don't do that. We use periodic boundary condition. We use a unit cell. Uh, the question is, how do you treat spin? Do you ignore it? Is it magnetic, non-magnetic? We have to talk about magnetism. And then there is an important aspect here. How do you choose the basis function? How do you solve this wave function? How do you represent the wave function? And you can use Slater type orbital Gaussians, uh, numerical basis, all kinds of things. We use the augmented plane wave for that. So there are different choices, and the uh, choice we make are marked in red. So let's take another example. Uh, so in the old days, there were, there were two communities, basically. It's density functional theory and many body theory. And in a simple picture, what is, uh, this, this is the difference. If you take a time average of the electron density, then you get an average effective potential in which your electrons move. That is the picture we are going to use, basically. Now, by this time averaging, you ignore some of the correlation effects and so the electronic correlation are not fully included and if you want to include them uh, then you have to use a many body theory <coughs> now the many body theory is rather complicated and uh, then people use model hamiltonians it's funny to talk in hamilton about hamiltonians but here you we talk about hamiltonians and so uh, they use Hamiltonians, but they need parameters, and the parameters are taken out of the sky, and then you don't really trust the results. They can't describe more complicated uh, effects than what we can do in this time averaged uh, approach. Uh, and now there are also schemes that you can first do a DFT calculation and then extract parameters with which you can then do a many body perturbation theory. So the two communities, uh, density functional theory and many body theory, have also joined recently in the last couple of years. So let's look at the Hamiltonian. You are an expert here. And up in Asia, Hamiltonians are a bit different than the Hamiltonians living in this city. So uh, you have the kinetic energy, you have a, a lattice potential, and then you have Coulomb potential. That's the way the physicists start this picture. The kinetic energy, then you have the interaction of the electrons with the nuclear charge, and then you have the interaction between the electrons. And if you do uh, an LDA or density functional theory approximation, then you still have the kinetic energy, the nuclear charge, but then you have a Coulomb potential coming from all the electrons. So you get the density here. And this one gives you an effective Coulomb potential. And then you have something which is called the LDA. And it ex uh, includes exchange correlation and uh, some of this aspect. And let me come to this point. This is not a formalism, but still it is needed. What we want to do is, and there is this famous from Purdue Jacob's ladder. So if you start with the Hartree scheme, which I briefly mentioned in a moment, then you have the local density approximation where uh, the potential depends essentially on the electron density. Or you use a generalized gradient approximation. You add a term which also depends on the gradient of the density. And you can use meta GGAs, occupied orbitals, hybrid orbitals. And we have a separate lecture on all these uh, 
uh, on the, all these schemes. Uh, and the accuracy goes up, but also the computer times goes up tremendously. So Jim Jacob's letter means you want to go to DFT heaven, that everything is exact, and that doesn't really exist. In quantum mechanics, you can really treat small molecules uh, with uh, full CI configuration interaction, and you really get the quantum mechanical exact result. But in practice, for a large system, nobody can do that. So one would like to have that, and you have to make approximations, and this is an essential aspect of what you uh, do nowadays. But let's go to the uh, essential points and then to the functional theory. So Holmberg cone theorem is exact, uh, and what they showed, uh, the, the total energy of an interacting inhomogeneous electron gas in the presence of an external potential, the nuclei, is a function of the density. So all you need to know is the density. So you can say the, uh, oops, you can say the, uh, I always touch this, uh, the energy is f the potential from the nuclei times the electron density, and everything else must be must just depend on the density. So that can be proven rigorously by mathematics. And cone sham, uh, I come to that from a different point of view. He said uh, what cone sham did is basically the, uh, in the cone sham the many body problem of the interacting electron is mapped to a problem which can you so which is solvable. So you solve it by a one electron reference system which has the same density. And once you have the density, everything is uniquely defined. So you replace the real system by an artificial system of non-interacting electrons, effective Hamiltonian, so to speak. And uh, the Konsham equation means you have this kinetic energy, the interaction between nuclei and electrons, the interaction between the electrons, and everything else is the quantum mechanics exchange correlation. I come to that in a different representation. But let's just look at this term. This term is important. If you look uh, at the, the Coulomb interaction, it's density times density at R, at R prime, divided by distance, charge one, divided two, charge two, divided by distance, Coulomb interaction. Everybody knows that. But what is uh, tricky in this term, uh, this density contains all the electrons. That means in this term you also include an interaction of the electron with itself, the self energy, which is unphysically. And so this unphysically term has to be cancelled here. And if you do that in Hart Fock, you have an equal term in the exchange term, and it's exactly cancelled. Now, here we make approximation, and then this self-interaction is not cancelled completely. It's approximately cancelled, and this is part of the problem of some of the applications. So let me try to give you in a pictorial way, a way to uh, explain what is exchange and correlation. And uh, one way, which was also already proposed by, by Slater, and the idea is why, now let's take an n electron system and pick out one electron. Then you're left with n minus one electrons. And if you pick the electron at this position, then this electron, and now let me not give it with mathematical terms, but in the picture, what this electron tells you, Pauli principle, basically, that the other electrons cannot be at the same position with the same quantum numbers, with the same shape of the wave function. That means, in other terms, that each electron carries an exchange hole, a forbidden zone, so to speak. The other electrons are not allowed to be in the same position as the first electron, the chosen electron. And this is called the exchange hole, the exchange correlation hole. And if that is done with uh, electrons of the same spin, it's called the Pauli exclusion principle. So one electron and the other has a forbidden zone uh, uh, exchange hole. Now, what you s should see from this picture is basically to understand why this exchange hole depends on the density. Now, let's assume a homogeneous electron gas, and you pick out one electron at one position, then the other electrons are not allowed to enter this place. So I have an exchange hole. And the integral over this exchange hole must be exactly minus one. One electron should not be there. Now, 
The integral means if the density is high, the shape, the size of the exchange field is very small. If the density is small, then the exchange field is very big. So you see that the size of the uh, system uh, of the exchange hole depends on the density. Now, in a real system, the density is never a constant. But in every system, you can say the size of the exchange hole and the same uh, holds for the correlation hole. It's also a hole, but this integral must integrate to one. So one understands at least qualitatively that the exchange correlation depends on the density uh, in a pictorial way. Now let's do the Cohn-Sham equation from a numerical point of view, which is also useful. If you take the total energy, this is a big number for a heavy element, for example. Now, it has the, uh, the term the kinetic, uh, the kinetic energy, uh, and the kinetic energy, then the, I explained these terms already. Now, in this Cohn-Sham equation, uh, you want to compute the kinetic energy as a function of the density. Thomas Ferner has already tried to do this, and he gets rough estimates. So rough estimates means it's uh, correct within a, f a few percent. Now, if you want to do chemistry, physics, a uh, total energy in percent range hmm, is meaningless. So that doesn't work. So you need to do this quantity accurately. So this is a very big number total energy, if you take the real theorem, uh, then the ratio between the kinetic energy uh, is, is the same order of magnitude. So this is a big number, this is a big number, the interaction electron nuclei, the Coulomb interaction, they are big numbers. And this quantity need to be computed very accurately. And then you have one term which contains everything else. Here is the self energy missing exchange correlation needs to be done. The kinetic energy of non-interacting particles also have a, a correction. And everything what is a correction needs to be in a separate term. And we call this separate term exchange correlation energy. Now, if you do a variational principle, that's the basic concept of the Cohn-Sham equation, uh, then you end up with a Schrodinger-like equation, which we now call Cohn-Sham equation. I like this expression because chaos are my initials. This is very nice. So we do the Cohn-Sham equations, and uh, in the Cohn-Sham, the kinetic energy, the nuclear potential, the Coulomb potential. Now we have the exchange correlation potential, which is the functional derivative of this quantity with respect to the density. Uh, here labeled rho. So we have the Cohn-Sham equation. How do you get the density? Now you get the density by summing over all the occupied uh, Cohn-Sham orbitals. So what uh, Cohn has introduced, he went back to orbitals, to wave functions again, but not to many electron orbitals, but independent particle orbitals, the Cohn-Sham orbitals. And that can be solved. That is the trick. And if you solve it, then uh, uh, this quantity, numerically, what I told you, uh, this quantity is a small quantity, and here in this small quantity you make an approximation, local lens approximation, GGA, or other schemes. Okay, so let's go in a uh, statement, uh, the uh, home back home, uh, that was done in Paris, and they did uh, uh, and his 80th birthday, we have uh, celebrated his birthday in Paris. And that was uh, the main statement was every observable quantity of a quantum system can be calculated from the density alone, and that is home back home. So you don't need the wave function, just the density. And uh, the density of the particles interacting with each other can be calculated as the density of an auxiliary system of non interacting systems. So this is introducing still wave function again, uh, cone chain orbitals, but then you uh, can solve the problem. Now, let me also mention something about Walter Cohn. Uh, you might know about this. He was born in Vienna. Uh, uh, in 1938, he had to leave Vienna because of the Nazis. He was Jewish, and so he was expelled. He went to Britain, and then he went to Canada, and later on, he wanted to study chemistry in Toronto. Uh, at that time, they did not allow that a, a person coming from Austria, from 
<coughs> the Hitler regime uh, enters the chemistry building. So he did mathematics, and then he got his master degree in mathematics in Toronto. He was then in Harvard. Uh, Van Fleck asked him to do band theory. He didn't want to. He did variational principle. And so they, he did with Schwinger. <coughs> you know Schwinger. Uh, we also have somebody from Carnegie Mellon here from Pittsburgh, where he had worked with Lattinger, Bell Labs, Copenhagen, Washington, Paris. That's where the Hohenberg Cohn theorem was done. Imperial College, ETH Zurich, University of California. In 79, he became founding director of Santa Barbara in California. Uh, the main points was the Hohenberg Cohn theorem in 1964, 1965. With his 80s birthday, he was still uh, roller skating in, in California. Uh, and in 98, he received the Nobel Prize. And uh, I think most of you have heard that he died in, in April 19th this year. So let me show you a few slides. Walter Cohn, when he received the Nobel Prize, and here uh, it's useful also to think uh, most of the, uh, us would have assumed that Walter Cohn is a physicist. Uh, mathematics, physics was his main interest. And in his key paper, uh, he wrote, I give a literal quote, we do not expect an accurate description of chemical binding. And for this paper, he received the Nobel Prize in chemistry, which is kind of uh, interesting. So. I know Walter Cohn for a very long time, and uh, it is uh, it is very bad. But it was really a fundamental aspect uh, that he <coughs> laid the ground in density functional theory. Uh, let's come back to the results. Uh, here I show you a, a well-known example that the choice of uh, functions is a crucial one. So if you take iron and you want to find out which is the ground state of iron, is it PCC or is it FCC, then you have to make a choice. And let's do uh, the uh, local spin density approximation. Uh, then you do a total energy calculation as a function of volume. You change the lattice constant and do your minimization of the total energy. And what you find is that FCC iron has a lower total energy with respect to the value taken here than the uh, PCC iron. And this result leads to a non-magnetic FCC result, and it's in contrast to experiment. Now, if you use the GGA result, then you get this curve, and you see the experimental volume increase with the minimum. And if you do the FCC, it has a higher energy. So GGA gives you quality, gives the right result, and the LDA the wrong result. So this is one example that the choice of a function is important. And th this one gets very good agreement. is also fortuitous. That doesn't happen all the time. So the choice of the function is a crucial step. Uh, let me also do it in a pictorial way. That was with Claudia Ambrose de Axel. Uh, so LDA was replaced by GGA. How she found two cars with these labels, <laughs> parking one after the other, is nice. So LDA and then GGA. Uh, that was in Graz, in Austria, taking this picture. Now let me show you another aspect which brings us from the total energy to the single electron picture. And this is Koppmann theorem. This is also something one should remember. What is Koppmann theorem? If you take an atom and if you remove an atom and make an ion, then the difference in total energy between the atom and the ion gives the ionization <coughs> energy. And what Koppmann has shown, again a mathematician, so to speak, uh, he received the Nobel Prize and that was the only work he ever did in, in chemistry, so to speak. Uh, and uh, he, he was uh, basically a mathematician. But let's show uh, in a simple picture <coughs> what that means. Uh, that's a busy slide. But let me show you the explanation. If you take the total energy of chlorine, and if you take the total energy of the chlorine plus and the chlorine atom, that the total energy difference is the uh, 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 orbital energy uh, you, <coughs> you find. So the total energy difference between atom and ion is equal to the orbital energy. And therefore you go from the total energy to the single electron picture, which is very important. Why does it work? What Koopmans has done 
And this is a schematic diagram which shows you. If you do a Koppelmann theory in Hartree Fock theory, then you get a ground state, which is not the correct one. The exact one would be this one. So this missing energy is the correlation energy. If you do the iron, then you can do with the iron uh, with the wave function coming from the ground state. Then you can relax the atom from uh, to have a new wave function in the iron. Then you get gain energy, relaxation energy. And then you're still missing the correlation energy. So what you should do is take this energy difference, the total energy between the exact atom and the exact ion. What Koppmann has shown, if you use the ground state wave function and you take the energy difference, then this energy difference is very good approximation to the real approximation. Why does it work? And I think this is very common in this field. Here you have a large correlation energy and you have two parameters, the relaxation and a smaller correlation energy. So the two areas you're making compensate each other and therefore you get roughly the good result in many cases. <coughs> now let's move to density functional theory instead of Hartley Fock. In density functional theory, the total energy is computed with a continuous variable of uh, 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 occupation numbers. So you get the energy shown in this curve. This is a paper I did quite a while ago. And uh, what you sh can show, Chenek theorem tells you uh, that the, or uh, the uh, orbital energy is the partial derivative of the total energy with respect to the occupation numbers. Graphically, that means Koppmann theorem is the difference between this energy and this energy. And if you take the de derivative, you have to remove half an electron. And if you remove half an electron, then you get a good estimate. Then one understands this picture, why this transition state sometimes is useful. It's an approximation, as usual, but it is useful. And the main point of Chenik and Koppmann theory is that you get from the total energy to the single electron picture. And that is what all people do. So if you do pain structure, you do a single electron picture. OK, let's show a few examples about the, uh, about the uh, effect of GGA. Here I show cobalt oxide, an ex example. If you do a total energy calculation with the local spin density and GGA, then you see one gives a good agreement and the other one has larger deviation. And if you look at the partial density of states, then you see in the LDA, this top band becomes very metallic. And here, in this case, the two symmetries split and it becomes almost an insulator. It should be an insulator. So you get it almost right with GGA and pretty uh, wrong with LDA. So let's look, can you analyze it? If you take the difference between the two poten potentials, the GGA and the LDA, then <coughs> now let's focus on this atom here. Then you have a situation where the neighboring atoms have the same spin, but these atoms have the opposite spin. And what LDA does, it averages and you smear out this effect. Now, what this sh picture shows you, that it differentiates between atoms with the same spin and with the opposite spin. So GGA has some angular correlation, which LDA does not have. <coughs> so one can sometimes explain where it comes from. If you do it in iron difluoride, then you see LDA is metallic, GGA is an insulator, as it should be. So there could be cases where LDA and GGA give qualitatively different results. Uh, we also are going to about electric field gradients. If you do the LDA, uh, it is pretty off. But if you do GGA, it uh, becomes uh, very accurate. Uh, Stefan will talk about field gradients uh, <coughs> and so hyperfine interaction. So that could be important. Let's take another example just to illustrate uh, it, there is not an easy, simple solution. And take 3D, 4D, or 5D elements, and let's find what it does theory give you in terms of lattice constant. And then you find different, let's experiment in the first row, 
the DEF LDA channel gradient approximation perturbed the answer of Wu Cohen. And so you see, for the 3D element, PBE gives better results uh, in the 4D Wu Cohen, and for the 5D. Uh, LDA gives the better results. So there are different cases. Now what do you do if you take copper gold? Then you have copper and gold and you have to make one choice, uh, one functional. And there is not a unique functional which works for everything perfectly. So the functional is a, a active field of research and that needs to be considered. From one paper, let's look at testing different functionals. Here is in the many uh, solids, and if you look at the qualitative trend, uh, that is the error you get in the lattice constant, and LDA almost gives to small lattice constant, and PBE gives bigger ones, and then you have schemes which reduce the error. So one has tried to find better functions which work good, let's say for the lattice constant, but then you also have magnetism or uh, uh, barriers or whatever. Uh, so there is not a uh, general functional which is perfect and works for everything. So this is the active field of research and we have one more lecture about the extended uh, density functional series. Uh, so briefly, LDA depends on the density, GGA has a gradient, there is this nice picture I saw with PBE, uh, Bordeaux, Berke, Ernsthoff. That's the way I interpret it. I ask the students, how come you have this on an on a aeroplane? It's portable breathing equipment. So you have to be careful with abbreviation. <laughs> yeah, so PBE is often used, meta GGA, LDA plus U, GGA plus U, hybrid functions. And so there are many aspects. Let me show you this one example for the self-interaction. Uh, this is the wave function, wave function divided by distance. But in this case, it's the nk, nk prime. If you interchange the two, then you can compute from this one the density, and from the other one the density one, density two divided by distance. And this is exactly the exchange term which cancels the self-interaction. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, uh, you, Fabian Tran will more talk more about these functions. So I'll, I'll skip this part because uh, that will be covered in a separate uh, lecture. So how do we solve it? And this is a, a busy slide again, but let's uh, co uh, summarize what we have learned so far. So we have a unit cell which is defined by the lattice constant and the angles and then the position of the atoms, where the atoms sit in the structure. Now if we have this structure given, then we have to do a self-consistent uh, cycle. Why do we have to need to go to self-consistent? It was already in Hartree, or in Hartree Fock, the same. If you want to solve this equation uh, for a given situation, you need the potential to compute the wave function. How do you get the potential? You need, in Hartree Fock, the wave function, in DFT, the density. You need the density to compute the potential, and you need the potential to compute the wave function. And that can only be done iteratively. So if you have in an iteration one case, then we do the uh, K point in the Brillouin zone. This is showing the irreducible part of the Brillouin zone uh, in, uh, for a FCC structure. And then you choose a number of K points, and for each K point you have to solve the Cohn-Sham equation. How do you solve the Cohn-Sham equation? You expand this wave function in a linear combination of basis sets, and then you apply the variational principle. The expectation value with respect to this coefficient uh, should be minimum, and that gives, defines a general eigenvalue problem. Now we are in mathematics. And here I don't need to explain what H is. H is the Hamiltonian, and S is the overlap matrix, and C are the uh, sum of all these coefficients. So you expand it in a basis function, and once you have the solution, then you can for the, the, uh, found a wave function, uh, sum of all the occupied state, and they get the new density. With the new density, they can generate the new potential, and with the potential, you can then. Uh, solve the total energy, and so Poisson's equation, and DFT. 
and that gives you an energy. And if the energy of this iteration with the previous iteration differs, you have to repeat the calculation and do it till you reach self-consistency. If you have reached self-consistency, then you can also compute the forces. Peter will describe the forces and see how you can move the atoms in the unit cell to find the equilibrium structure. So you minimize the energy till all the forces are zero. And if you have done all these cycles, then you compute, <coughs> compute the properties. So this is the basic concept of uh, TFD calculation of the mean code. So this is the mathematics to this variational principle uh, that you can uh, now have different ways of solving the uh, eigenvalue problem. So let's look at the wave function. How choose the wave function? Uh, and this is where you have to make choices. So you have the, the scheme. Uh, you can use plane waves. I will briefly mention what pseudopotentials are, project augmented wave. There are all kinds of schemes. And what we are using is the linear augmented plane wave. So it's one choice of solving this problem. There are other possibilities uh, and that needs to be done. Let me briefly mention the, the pseudopotentials uh, in this picture. So if you have a wave function of a heavier element, then you have uh, nodes in the radial wave function. And these nodes, this nodal structure, can very badly pre presented with plane waves. And what people have said, yeah, but this node is somewhere in the inter inner part of the, near the atom and don't really contribute to the bonding. Let's uh, reproduce, uh, let's generate something which has the correct wave function outside, but inside we replace it by pseudo wave function, which can be represented by sine waves. Uh, then you lease, uh, then you don't have the real wave function, you have a pseudo wave function, and that uh, can speed up the calculation. And this is one possibility to solve the problem. Uh, that goes back to Hellman a long time ago. Uh, another aspect about the pseudo potential. Now, the main point of, of the Winkel K, and I have to speed up, uh, was uh, APW, LAPW, and so on. And they are summarized in these articles. And that will give you in a uh, quick picture what is the basic concept. The idea is if you have a unit cell, then you can describe in the unit cell, uh, you define atomic spheres of a given size, non-overlapping. And what you do, which is shown in this graph over here, if you look at the wave function along this line, this is even a surface and the, uh, atoms, then you see you have plane waves which uh, have some form. But if you come very close to a nucleus, you have this nodal structure which are difficult to represent. Now what Slater has suggested, if you have a plane wave and you come near to an atom, use an atomic-like function. And that this has two advantages. On the one hand, it, it becomes much more accurate. Uh, you can really treat all the electrons. And the other one, it also helps the interpretation. If you have just plane waves, you don't really know what's going on. And here, uh, we use inside the atomic sphere a function which is like in a spherical potential, a radial function times spherical harmonics. So you can talk about S, P, D, px, by, pz, orbital. So you have a chemical interpretation of the orbitals. So schematically, if you have a plane wave entering a sphere, then you replace it, you augment it by an atomic solution. So this is the basic concept. So you have in the interstitial region, plane waves, and inside the spheres, you have a radial function times spherical harmonics, like you would do in, a, in an atom. So this is even taken from my thesis. Uh, if you do the APW case, then what the original APW was, you have to specify the energy. And if you do the energy, you can solve the radial equation and uh, then set up the Hamiltonian. Uh, Hamiltonian again. Uh, and we have the Hamiltonian and the overlap matrix and the determinant should vanish. It doesn't, so you have to change the energy step by step and find the series numerically. That is very tedious. 
uh, that was the way it was done in the APWS scheme. So what is the mathematical problem? The basis function depends on energy. And you should have an energy independent basis function. And that was made possible by the linearized augmented plane wave. And what do you do? Let's take a density of state schematically. Then you have bonding orbitals and anti-bonding orbitals and a whole range. And the radial wave function inside a sphere could look something like this. For the bonding orbitals, you have a zero slope going to the neighboring atom. Or for the anti-bonding orbital, you have a wave function. Oops. Uh, for the anti-bonding orbital, you have a wave function uh, which goes to zero and to, it, to the next atom has a, uh, has a node. So you have a bonding and anti-bonding. And so the energy radial wave function in this energy range changes from bonding to anti-bonding. And so what you do in LEPW is basically you take an energy at a fixed energy in the center of the band, compute this wave function, that's the UL for a given energy, and then you take to uh, allow for this energy variation a U dot, the energy derivative of this function with respect to energy. So you have two functions, U and U dot, and now how do you determine the coefficients A and B? Now, if you plot again a plane wave coming to a sphere, then at the sphere boundary, uh, you have uh, the option in APW, then you could say the wave function should be continuous uh, at the boundary. And in LEPW, you could say the wave function at the first derivative should be continuous. And if you do that, with two conditions, you can fix A and B. So that is the basic concept of the LEPW method, that you fix, the, you augment each plane wave whenever it enters the atomic sphere by an atomic-like function, which is now linearized. So it's not energy dependent anymore, so you choose the function. So what that means in practice, Peter will explain that the, uh, in the next talk, you have to s uh, define these parameters where this E sub L are taken, and you have to uh, use these matching conditions. So uh, the potential approximation I mentioned in the old days, in the 70s, uh, so one has used the Maffentin approximation, and I could show you a picture of that. The schematic is on some title, it is not a unit cell, it was used for some phase transition. If you look at this uh, top plane here, then you have titanium, oxygen, strontium atom, and that is what we call full potential. What was the Maffentin? You took the spherical average around the atom and the volume average in between and then you end up with a muffin tin. Uh, you all know the muffin tin. So the muffin tin is a crude approximation to the real system, and in the old days, uh, only that was possible. Now we do a full potential calculation. Mathematically speaking, that means uh, that in the, uh, in the terms here, uh, the potential in the uh, interstitial region is a Fourier series, now, if you t only take the very first term, it's a constant, but then it's a muffin tin. And in the, in in the uh, uh, spheres, you have the radial dependence and the angular dependence, crystal harmonics with the proper symmetry. And uh, so the muffin tin would have only the first term here and only the first term here. That's a crude approximation. And that looks graphically like this. And now we do a full potential. We make no shape approximation. And that has given the uh, calculation a significant uh, more uh, uh, predictability. And as a concept which needs to be considered is uh, all electron. So let's take a simple example, titanium. And what I show you here, remember Rydberg, what we use usually the 13.6 EV. Uh, so the Rydberg units, uh, if you take the 1s, 2s, 2p orbitals, that are very low in energy. And the corresponding states, are, the wave function, are confined inside the sphere, what we call that core states. Now, if you go to the other extreme, the valence state, the 3D, 4S, 4P states, they are delocalized, and therefore they, are, uh, they form the chemical bonding. 
but there is something in between, which we call semi-core state 3S and 3P. Take P, that is one principal quantum one, one less than for the valence state. And sometimes these states in titanium dioxide, that was the case, for example, uh, need to be taken into account. They are almost inside the sphere, but not completely. I'll show you a picture in a moment. So we have three categories, core states, valence states, and semi-core states. And we treat them differently. We want to treat all the electrons uh, uh, properly. So the core states can be done with an atomic program in this spherical symmetric potential. Fully relativistically can do everything. Uh, the valence state, and let me show you in this case, the titanium 3P radial wave function. That is this lower line here. It's almost inside the sphere of two bore radii. But there is a little bit what we call core leakage. So it's a little bit of charge density outside the spheres. So it's not a real core state. Now what David Singh has proposed to construct, uh, and I don't go to the details, so-called local orbitals, where you force this local orbital to be zero at the sphere boundary and have zero slope. And then you add the local orbitals to your basis set, and then by adding the other terms which we have, uh, four P states, then you can write, describe the real system because it's a small difference, a small correction. So you have the uh, uh, core states, for the relativistic, the valence state, and for the semi-core state, we can use some tricks like the local orbitals. Uh, a similar scheme was invented to go from the APW also to an APW plus local orbitals, and now we distinguish these local orbitals with smaller LO in contrast to the capital LOs, which I've shown you before, and that was done uh, in collaboration with the uh, uh, Uppsala group, yeah. and is these additional local orbitals. So uh, let me show you what you can do if you go from the LEPW, uh, that is uh, a sodium electrosodal light, and if you look at, at the one quantity, uh, the force acting on one of the atoms as a function of brain waves. And the reason for showing this is if you take the LEPW method and you use not enough plane waves, you would have a force in the wrong, with the wrong sign. So you would move the atom in the wrong direction. Now, and if you take as many as you can, then it converges. But you have to go to a very large system. And if you do it with the LO, with the local orbital scheme, you can already reach a reasonable value with half the size of the number of plane waves. So you save computer time. And this is one example how you can do efficiently uh, by improving the method and making the proper choice which is more accurate. That is one example. So uh, a summary of the uh, li linearized augmented APW plus local orbitals and the plane waves. So we have different matching conditions in APW match on the value, in LEPW value matching in value and slope, and uh, that gives you a different basis function which represent <coughs> the wave functions. So the method is implemented uh, and uh, a summary of these details are given in this paper. So I could show you the main authors of the Win2K uh, code. Uh, and uh, certainly I don't need to introduce you. Uh, you hear more about Dieter Blacher. Uh, I should mention that Dieter Grasnicker was a mathematician who also worked in my group. Uh, Joachim Lutz, he did the graphic user interface, is a chemist. And Dieter Martin came originally from Denmark, uh, is a crystallographer and has done a lot in programming, and he will be in the fall my successor. He will follow, uh, uh, come to Vienna. He is originally from Denmark. So let's show a few things about the, uh, the international use. We have about 2,600 licenses in Europe and America in industry, uh, so it's continuously growing. It's used a lot. Uh, where does the name come from? When we first published the paper, 
the journal decided to give it the name Wien, not Rhein, Wien. And for obvious reasons, it was developed in the TU Wien. What, what is TU Wien? That's Sam Tricky, uh, the third author of the original work. So every country has the feeling we are in the center of the, of the earth. So therefore, there is Austria, and if you want to read more details, uh, there was also a book published uh, in, um, by Signor Vaco uh, that it was developed in 93, 95, 97, into K, and you can read all the details. <coughs> yeah. Okay, there are many people who have contributed to the code. It's not just us, and uh, I mentioned one particular here, but I mean, there are many people who have helped us to develop the code. We have many uh, workshops of this size. We started in Vienna, in Trieste. We also have a workshop in Isfahan, Penn State, Kyoto, uh, Los Angeles, Singapore, Nath, uh, Warsaw, Singapore, and now McMaster. Hamilton, I should say. Good. Uh, Okay, the question is, should I stop here? Maybe, maybe this slide I still show you. Uh, what is the self-consistent cycle? So you start with the input density, come to the, the, the potential. With the effective potential, you get wave function. From the wave function, you get a new density, and you start iterating till you reach self-consistency. Uh, in practice, what that means, take copper as example, that illustrates what self-consistency is. If you are not sure whether copper is in the 3D 10 4 is 1, the 3D 9 4 is 2 configuration, you start your calculation with this or that, then you get this or this band structure. So a very different one. But if you take one of these and go to self-consistency, you end in both cases with self-consistency, which is somewhere in between that should illustrate somehow what is self-consistency doing in practice. Now the program uh, details parallelization will be covered by, by Peter Blaha. Graphical user interface is something which you will also hear and see. Uh, maybe that this one thing I should mention here, the space group. So what we have, titanium dioxide, for example, then you have the Wyckoff position. So by knowing the crystal structure, you uh, can simply say which kind of atomic position do we have uh, in this system. And uh, you will do, talk about titanium dioxide. I will skip this, but I show you one more slide which was published very recently. And I think here we should especially thank Stefan for this. This is a paper where you can see uh, the list of authors. It's the first time that I have a paper with so many authors, Peter Blaha, myself, and Stefan. And this is a comparison of 40 different computer codes. If you just look at the list of institutions which are involved, there are 45. And what they show especially is the most accurate code is by no surprise the win to k code. And that has helped other codes with pseudo-potential, uh, or the soft pseudo-potential, so to adjust the parameters so they can get the correct result. If two codes use the same approximation in terms of DFD, they should get the same results, but they don't. But nowadays, the good programs, this is the all electron category up here, they have only very tiny differences. And therefore, uh, the predictability uh, is given. And the second aspect is if you want to improve the functions, then you know for a given functions, we have the, rect the correct so solution. So we have to improve the functional. And for that, this study was very, very useful. So this is a, a detail which you can look up in the, in the aspect. Let me summarize here. What I've tried to do is show you some aspect about the structure model. We have a unit cell. You hear about supercells and surfaces, how they can be done. We have to think about the quantum mechanics, yield field. Do we need many body theory? Is it a ground state? Do we have excited states? We also hear about core level, the uh, core whole excitation spectra, that one has to be careful. Then you have to say we need converged results. That could be the basis set. Do we need more plane waves? Do we need more k points? 
that needs to be studied. And then you could also think about other effects, temperature, uh, the, if the experiment is finite temperature and we do it at zero Kelvin, maybe the temperature is causing a deviation between theory and the experiment. Uh, so back to Vienna and let me show you Walter Kohn again uh, at the TFT conference in Vienna, which I organized in 1997, then the Nobel Prize at my birthday. Uh, and we could also interpret V 2 k the world of interacting electrons and nuclear, due to Walter Kohn. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.